In this episode, we're going to talk about nutrient requirements for microbial growth. Uh, if you think about it, a microorganism that gets into a human being in uh, one form or another that wants to cause an infection is going to need to grow. It needs to double and divide and go through exponential growth because just a handful of bacterial cells will not be able to overwhelm or overcome our immune system. And so uh, it's going to need to be able to grow. And in order to grow, it needs nutrients. And these nutrients are going to come from your tissues. They're going to come from your blood, from your cells, from your interstitial fluids, and so on. And so what we want to think about in this short video are what those nutrient requirements are. What are the macronutrients, those that are required in large quantities? What are the micronutrients required in smaller quantities? And is there a way to classify microorganisms, bacteria in particular, based on where they get their carbon for biosynthesis and where they get their energy to create ATP. Those are the two most important resources they need. And so we can actually think about them in those terms. And that's what we're going to be talking about here today. So imagine I, I hand you a catalog and I say, hey, I need you to build a bacterium, order all the parts that you need. You know enough now about microorganisms, about bacteria to know how to um, how to design one, really. You'd, you'd probably order some phospholipid bilayers so you could make a membrane. And you would order some peptidoglycan so you could build a cell wall. And if it's a gram negative, you're going to need to order some LPS. And maybe you want some, uh, uh, some flagellar proteins and some fimbriae. And maybe you want to put a capsule around this cell of yours. And then on the inside, you're certainly going to need some DNA and some RNA and some ribosomes and other metabolites from, to support metabolism and so on. So think for a minute about what those component parts are to a bacterial cell and then ask, okay, if a bacterium needs to double its entire mass just to undergo one round of division, where does it get all this material from and what material specifically does it need? Well, maybe it gets lucky and find some of the sugars that it needs already preformed and doesn't have to build them. And maybe it finds some amino acids and some nucleotides preformed, ready to roll, doesn't need to build them. Great. But in most cases, under most situations, they're going to need to actually build some of these things themselves from scratch. And so we want to start with the macronutrients that are required for all of this biosynthesis. Let's start with carbon, because carbon is arguably the one that is going to be needed in the greatest quantities. What does a cell need carbon for? Well, virtually everything when it comes to biosynthesis, every organic macromolecule is built on a skeleton of carbon and therefore it's going to need lots and lots of carbon in order to build a new cell. But it's also going to need a lot of energy for all that biosynthesis and so it's going to need a lot of carbon that it can also break down by either respiration or fermentation in order to extract high energy electron pairs and ultimately drive either uh, substrate level and or oxidative phosphorylation to make lots of ATP, right? So that it can support all of this growth that it's rapidly undergoing. So carbon, without a doubt, it needs in the largest of quantities of anything. Second one I would want to talk about would be nitrogen. What do you think a bacterium would need a lot of nitrogen for? Well, two key uh, macromolecules, the nucleotides, which ultimately polymerize to form your DNA and RNA, and RNA nucleic acids, and the amino acids, which can be polymerized to form proteins. Nucleotides have a nitrogenous base. Nitrogenous means nitrogen rich. So your nucleotides have to have a lot of nitrogen. And you figure even just a chromosome could be three, four, five million base pairs. That is a lot of nitrogen just to duplicate the chromosome. Amino acids, every protein, every amino acid has an amino group. And so every protein, which is made of hundreds of amino acids, has hundreds of nitrogens. And then there are thousands of proteins and thousands of copies of these proteins in the cell. And so a lot of nitrogen gets poured into nucleotide biosynthesis and amino acid biosynthesis, particularly during cell division. Okay, so we've got a lot of carbon, a lot of nitrogen. Next one's a lot of phosphorus. Why would the cell need a lot of phosphorus? Well, nucleotides, again, for one, right? If you remember, nucleotide is made of a ribose or deoxyribose sugar, that big old nitrogenous base, and a phosphate group. So again, if you've got let's say 5 million base pairs, that's 10 million phosphates for a single chromosome, and you want to double that, you need another 10 million phosphate groups just to carry out DNA replication. 
Add to that all the RNA that needs to be produced. Add to that the phospholipid bilayers. Those phospholipids, every single one has a phosphate group on it. And how many billions or trillions of those are in a single membrane? So the sheer quantity of phosphate that's required for, for uh, nucleic acids and phospholipid uh, membranes is, is staggering, honestly. And then every cell needs a pool of ATP and ADP to cycle, and that's going to require a lot of phosphate as well. And if you remember, ATP is just the triphosphate version of the adenine uh, RNA nucleotide. So it kind of lumps in with our nucleotide concept. The fourth and final of the macronutrients I want to talk about is sulfur. And you're thinking, okay, that's a little odd. What's the cell going to need so much sulfur for? Well, two of the amino acids, cysteine and methionine, as I'm sure you remember, have sulfhydryl groups in their variable R groups that make each amino acid unique. And you're thinking, okay, well, that's only two amino acids, Dave. Why is that such a big deal? Well, that's two out of 20. That's 10% of your amino acids. So for all the, the proteins in the proteome of a cell, 10% of that mass requires sulfur to even exist. So sulfur is going to be required in very large quantities, particularly to, to support those two amino acids. So these are um, used in organic biosynthesis, building organic molecules. There are also some macronutrients that are inorganic in nature that are not used to build organic molecules, but they're used as cofactors to support enzyme function. If an enzyme requires a cofactor, and you remember a cofactor is an inorganic molecular ion that um, is necessary for the enzyme function, um, if it requires it, it absolutely requires it, right? So it's got to have it. It's not like, hey, if I got magnesium, I can work a little better. No, if you have to have magnesium, you either have it or you don't, and you either function or you don't. Let's use magnesium as an example. DNA polymerase, we were just talking about DNA replication. DNA polymerase requires a magnesium ion. If it doesn't have it, the polymerase won't function. DNA replication can't take place, and nor can uh, uh, cell division. So magnesium, you can see why that's going to be required in large quantities. The others are the most common cofactors that we see for various enzymes. So macronutrients, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And when you get carbon, you also get hydrogen and oxygen with it. Um, and so those are going to be available for building. You don't, the cell doesn't have to intentionally go out and look for hydrogen sources or uh, fixed uh, oxygen sources. And then these, these high-quantity cofactors in the form of, of ions that are needed to support enzyme function. Now, the cell also has a variety of, of vitamin and mineral needs uh, that are required in, in much smaller quantities. And so we call these micronutrients. Again, the nutrient isn't small. It's just required in small quantities. <clears throat> I gave a list here from uh, just off the box of, of Centrum, right? A, a, a human supplement. And it turns out that our enzymes need very much the same things as bacterial enzymes. And you can see there's a lot of vitamins at the top of the list. Vitamins serve as coenzymes. A coenzyme is just like a cofactor in that it's not part of the protein that makes an enzyme, but it's required for the enzyme to function. But in the case of a coenzyme, it's an organic molecule, not an inorganic molecule. Some of these vitamins can act immediately as a coenzyme, exactly as they are. Others have to be modified. And you might even, even uh, uh, recognize some of, the, some of the compounds that are in here and some of the names of some of the compounds that are in here. But I also want to highlight that some of these are required in really small quantities, like selenium, right, or chromium. These trace elements, if you will, are required, but in only trace quantities, again, to support the function of some enzymes. This list, even though it's made for um, a supplement for human beings, is very, very accurate in terms of what would be required for most bacteria as well. So we've got our macronutrients required in large quantities. We have micronutrients also required, but in much smaller quantities. So what I want to do now is I want to think in terms of classification. How can we classify or think about or sort of uh, um, compartmentalize in our brains bacteria based on their two most important resource needs, carbon and energy? Well, the terms we use for their carbon source are autotrophs and heterotrophs. Autotrophs can take CO2, inorganic carbon, straight out of the atmosphere and build their own stuff. 
that would be like plants, right? Plants can take CO2 from the atmosphere and build other organic molecules from scratch. You and I can't do that. Plants can. There are bacteria that can do that as well. You and I, on the other hand, are heterotrophs, meaning that we have to eat something that is pre-reduced, pre-fixed organic carbon like glucose. Many bacteria fall into this category as well. So either, <clears throat> either the microorganism can build its own biomass from CO2, we'd call them an autotroph, or they need biomass that is already built that they can simply rearrange into what they need, and we call those heterotrophs. Now for the energy source, we see energy for ATP production coming either from light or from chemicals. Right, remember when we're talking energy, we're talking ATP production. How do we make our ATP? Phototrophs can use sunlight and harness that sunlight in order to make ATP. Chemotrophs, on the other hand, need chemicals. They, we need high energy electron pairs from some actual substance, not light, in order to drive our ATP production. So you and I, for example, are chemo heterotrophs. And it turns out that most bacteria that cause disease are also chemo heterotrophs. However, there are bacteria in every one of these categories on planet Earth. They are very, very diverse in their metabolism. All right, let's hit some highlights here as we close this video out. Number one, bacteria need, you can underline that and say require, large quantities of, of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur in order to biosynthesize and grow and thus cause an infection. They also need, i.e. require, trace quantities of various vitamins and minerals for coenzymes and cofactors. Again, can't establish an infection if any of these things are missing. And finally, it's important that you understand that they have diverse strategies for obtaining their two most important resources, carbon for their biosynthesis and energy for their ATP production. And we have ways of classifying them. The most important category uh, among pathogens that cause disease in humans are going to be the chemo heterotrophs. I hope this video was useful to you. hope you got a lot out of it. Feel free to watch as many times as you need to to understand this material. And I look forward to talking to you in our next video.